with five point, like the beginning of this, this whole chapter is just supervised um, machine learning, which I'm sure you're quite comfortable with being a statistician. Um, and I think the concept of like, oh, it's machine learning, but really even things like linear regression, you know, we, we do these things often. It's just understanding um, how and where they can be used and un like just getting the steps, you know, getting your data clean enough to be able to perform these analyses. It's actually not that complicated when you break it down. It's more just the, the framework of which to do it in. Um, so for people that, I mean, again, this, this applies so much to you, but for um, understanding like the different types of machine learning, um, you know, last time, the past two weeks, we've been looking at the exploratory and like unsupervised learning. So like, okay, which ones are most associated um, as opposed to like, how can we predict something exactly? And that's more of supervised machine learning where we're looking to actually predict an outcome as opposed to just to seeing what is there. Um, and then the confirmatory, like the statistics, like if you're looking at a t-test, for example, like, okay, is the weight of this animal different, the means of the animal weight different in this group versus another group? So that would be more of a confirmatory, like, is there actual significance to it? Um, so I thought this was kind of an interesting graphic to kind of explain the differences between machine learning and statistics and how they're all related. Um, and as we talked last week with unsupervised learning, it's more of taking um, your data and trying to see how you can divide them into different groups. Um, and that's, so that's unsupervised learning. But supervised learning, on, on the other hand, you have your data and you are able to determine, you know, okay, this is this, this is this, this is this. Um, you can then tell a model, okay, these are the items that we have and we know this is this. Um, based off this data, can you create a model that can describe what each of these colors are, and then you can perform the model test um, with some of the other data, and then use that predictive model to test it and see if it gets the outcome correct. Um, so again, just some simple um, visualizations um, to describe the differences between um, unsupervised and supervised machine learning. Um, for the example for the, oh, I thought I had a new slide, I'll have to fix this later. Um, but for the examples of what they are, are going through in the book with this, um, I went ahead and I just put in the the data packages for, um, not the data packages, the file paths and everything to prep for the examples for this chapter um, that's here. And so this is like the um, preliminary data set. I think they're looking, what did they say they're looking at with this? This is, um, what do they say? Oh, uh, tumor biopsies to, what do they say? The gene expression data of the glioblastin with tumor samples. Um, to try to predicting the subtype using the different molecular markers, I think in this case would be um, genome methylation, based, like basing um, the disease phenotype based off methylation markers. Um, and so they've got 184 tumor sets in here. Um, so, or tumor types in here. So um, it's a good little starter set to look at. So that's each of these um, are looking at um, the gene expression values for different gene expressions. And then also um, believe they also have methylation markers. Um, so I just wanted to go ahead and get that um, loaded up for the examples more so for, you know, when you're working through it later to do that. Um, so the first step of doing the predictive machine, my internet's slow. Okay. Um, first step of doing the machine learning, you have to transform the data. Um, and so, as we saw last time, um, if the data is not transformed, you might have some things that are wildly out of scale. You may have something that's like many thousandfold um, increase or decrease over the mean values, and transforming that to like a log scale would help. Uh, normalize some of these values. So um, we first want to get the data um, correctly. So to get, get the data better formatted. So you can see here, like the means are kind of all over. Um, and so if we log transform it, um, the first plot is the untransformed plot of the genetic frequency. So this is like way out of Scale, like you have one um, gene expression frequency that is super way higher than the others. So 
So if we log transform it here on the right, um, much more uh, readable, much everything's much more closely related to each other than just having one gene expression be super, super high and then the other one not as much. Um, so that helps. Um, so um, we just transpose, and then also we just um, flip the gene expression data. So like the, the log expression is then on the right-hand side as opposed to, I mean, on the y-axis as opposed to the x-axis. Um, the next thing that we do is um, filter and scale the data. Um, so here in this data set, they um, remove like the, if it, this is something that, again, it comes down to what kind of analysis you're really looking to do. So in this set, they removed the values that didn't really have any variation between the data sets that were, you know, nearly zero variation because it's likely not to have any real indicated value of the differences between different tumor types. Um, so they went ahead in this example to remove the variations that don't really, they don't think will have a biological relevance to it. Um, so um, in the caret library, um, there's a function that pre-process um, will, um, if when you're looking at the data, okay, so most of the values are the same, they're cutting off, they're only cutting off, um, they're only keeping 15% of um, the values essentially. And so that's the pre-process that creates that. Um, and then you are then using the predict function um, that gives back the filtered data set. Um, and so our now our data set is under the uh, transformed. So we transformed it earlier up here with the um, gene expression and now it's the transformed gene expression. Um, and now the um, near zero variation NZV in the transformed gene expression. This is now our um, more cleaned data set. Um, so when it comes down to the, um, how many different variables uh, we want to use to predict. And again, it kind of just depends on um, the data that you're looking at. Um, and this is where, you know, the scientist input comes in, like looking at, okay, we think there's going to be um, just a few different predictors or this, you know, could be a very nuanced type of data set and you've got a lot of different predictors. You may, you know, have five or 10, um, but in this one, um, looking at just two data um, variable predictors would be for the two here and then um, sorting um, I lost you that data yeah oh you lost me oh no I lost you your presentation I can see oh okay yeah I'm um oh don't know what part did you see last no no just now just now okay yeah, I'm, uh, I'm at my dad's house, which is more in the um, in the rural part. So the service isn't, um, it may cut in and out. Basically, basically yeah. you, you didn't, uh, you use the predict function on the, uh, on a sort of new data uh, yeah. filtered with zero variance. Fit. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. You have, removing the values that um, don't have any real biological relevance to the data. Um, and I think it's something with biological data too, and it's something that I've seen in my own work, um, that just because you have statistical significance on something doesn't mean it actually means anything. You know, anything can be statistically significant just given the differences in the values um, depending on the data, but um, for something to be biologically pertinent, and then um, you do it again do, uh, at opposite. So you use the, uh, because if you, oh, maybe I've, I've just seen the, the, next, uh, the next step. When you use again the, the um, function. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So the pre-process is what, what creates the filter for it, but it doesn't actually apply it to the data set. Um, so that's when you're cutting out, um, the 15 percent you're only taking the 15 percent of the data that are actually um unique and not just the um zero values and then you're using the predict value to actually filter it or to actually like transform the data 
or filter the data, excuse me. So one of them is just creating the filter and the other one is using the filter. Yeah. Um, and then um, we've gone into the variable predictors. So again, the variables, again, depending on the data set there are, sometimes you might have a lot of different variables and it could be a very, you know, a very nuanced type of, um, data where, you know, you've got um, multiple different factors that are contributing to a disease phenotype. Um, there might be more variable predictors as opposed to something that's like, do you have this gene expression? Yes or no, you know, um, as opposed to, you know, um, for like autosomal dominant diseases, where if you just have one copy of that gene, um, you are likely to get this disease. And so you could say, in that case, you know, environmental factors aside, it's a yes, no, you know, just the one variable predictor um, for having that. And then, um, but something with cancer, when there's a lot of environmental variables, um, there's also the, um, what you call it, the, sorry, um, environmental variables. There could be a lot of different predictors that influence whether something, a disease phenotype appears. And so that's where um, it's up to us um, as a scientist apply, analyzing the data to determine how many variable predictors that there are. Um, and this is um, kind of just a, um, you'll have to look at it and to see what best describes the data itself. Um, when the, so this is currently with the uncentered data and this is just the data that had been filtered and log transformed, but then also you can, from that log transformed data, you can still further scale it um, doing the same thing. So you're just centering the data around um, the pre, um, this is not the, if you notice here, this is not the um, near zero variation data set. This is just another way of um, centering the data. So you don't necessarily have to filter out these zeros. It's, uh, or like the non-zero variation. Um, there's other ways to look at it too. You may just wanna just center the data around these zeros and so you're really just looking at like the big differences in gene expression um, levels between all of the different um, genes that were analyzed and so if you've got you know some genes that have huge amounts of variation between the data set the centering the data um, may provide a better uh, input for that or it may not it's it just different ways to look at it um, so this version um, you filter out variables that were um, highly correlated. So effectively things that were already, um, we already know that they are related. Um, remove that because you already know that's gonna be an option. So this is um, just another way to fit the model. And so that way you're not, at, you're not spending computational energy fitting a model when you already know something that's already gonna be related regardless. Um, and then the last thing I did would um, do handling the missing values. And I'm sure as you are well aware that NA values are not zero values. And so there are different ways to handle NA values. Um, so um, one thing you can do is either discard those samples or that data point, um, or that particular um, gene, if there's a lot of missing values from it. Um, so that's one way to do that. So um, doing this um, here, they're just removing the um, missing NA data points. Um, and another way you can do it too, um, which I, I don't know, I'm not that comfortable doing this with my stuff, but then again, it may just depend on um, how many data points you have missing and whether, um, you think that you, it can be imputed, but you can also try to predict what the missing values would be. Um, and the caret also has a method to um, do that. So with the caret package, um, from what I'm gathering, there's the pre-process, which is where you actually create the, um, the filter that you're looking for. And so here um, they're imputing any missing values um, with a method called median impute. And then they're actually creating the data set with the predicted um, median values um, as a new um, data frame. 
Um, so that's one way to do missing values. There's another way to do it too, um, doing it through um, K nearest neighbors, through the RAN package. Um, and again, similar to the carrot package, um, creating the pre-process, you're creating the filter and then using predict to actually create the new data frame with um, the imputed values using the K nearest neighbors uh, imputation method. Okay. Um, so it, uh, can I just uh, interrupt you for a second? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, this function pre-process. So what that it, it does train the data while filtering. Uh, I, because I'm I'm not that practical with caret. I've used it a couple of times, and um, I really prefer study models. So. Um, yeah, I I agree. I. It, it, it sounds like carrot is more for base R. Yeah, yeah. But basically, yeah. what is the model? The model is, uh, wh where is it? The function for the model, the method used for the model? Yeah, the method for the model is what um, essentially is the model that is being used in okay. carrot. And so the, I guess whatever method you have, and there's tons of different models that can be performed in carrot, um, then using um, you're just changing the method because up here too, they had it um, the same thing, the pre-process, the method equals center, um, method equals correlation. So the model that you're using is under the method. Okay. Because you, do, you don't, don't, don't you need to specify like LM or GLM or... Uh, so you, it's, it's, it's a linear model that you are uh, per uh, performing. Because I, I think I missed that bit. Yeah, um, so I don't, let me go pull up my R. I'm gonna unshare my screen for a moment while I go dig up my R um, code for, and we can try to work through it. Cause I'm not actually sure. So how would you do, okay. So you said you're, do you use tiny models more often? Oh, you're muted. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm more practical with uh, with tidy models, but you know it's the same. It's from the same author. I lost your presentation. It's from the same author, but um, it's it's a different syntax. So you basically specify the step with the, with the help of the step functions. You can actually do uh, the zero variance and all the other things that you. Uh, are performing okay so the difference that you use the step function and you uh, made a recipe and then you use the recipe uh, with um, uh, a model syntax okay you assign an engine the type of models and then you put everything inside a workflow so you can test different models and different recipes and everything but now that my my question is uh, one, I use pre-process function uh, mm -hmm. on Caret. Uh, am I doing, am I training my data? I might do, uh, because um, I'm, I have a... Yeah, um, I think that you're doing that all before you're even training your data. Like this is just, in this part of just cleaning your data. So instead of using, I mean, could you use tidy models also to um, clean the, um, to like pre-process your data also? Like, is there, is there a workflow for cleaning and getting your data ready for training in tidy models? Can you hear? Me? I can't yeah. hear you. <laughs> no, but just that, just my question is: I can can I have I am applying the predict function on the preprocessed data, and uh, um, but have they been trained already or not? No, not trained yet. No, ah, okay. this is before so everything is trained. Yeah. So I I can apply the predict function on the preprocessed data without having training the data first. Okay. That's, yes, that's, yeah. Okay, now it's fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's um, getting the data to the point where it can 
be split into a training set and a test set. Um, so this is just still part of the data cleaning and the data wrangling process to get the data ready to perform training. Um, and so that's what I was asking. Is there methods in tidy models to clean the data and process the data? Or is that just done through tidyverse stuff beforehand? And then you have your prepared data set that you then put into tidy models. Is that how that is that for tidy models? Is that more how that works? You're cleaning the data entirely beforehand just with general like dplyr and things like that and then taking it to tidy models you you do both you can do uh like uh you can um like tidy the data and then apply pre-processing steps uh with feature engineering okay such as for gotcha, example, gotcha. using the step functions uh, and then uh, uh, you apply the, um, uh, you set the model and then use the recipe and the model inside a workflow to fit the model with your process okay. and everything. And then once you fit it, you predict on, on the test data. So now got it, got it. Okay. my question was because I, what, what I'm, predicting if I didn't train the why I use the predict function. Um, <laughs> basically yeah, yeah. My, it's me because I haven't uh, had a minute to look at the the thing. So just a question, yes, not nothing else. That's yeah, I get yeah. Um, and I'm also like I don't ever use base R and so seeing everything being processed here with base R is also kind of making me confused um, because I'm so used to using um, the tidyverse. Um, I would, I don't know if I have time to do this, but I would love to see this book like rewritten in a tidy, you know, the comp like tidy computational genomics. Um, I just think it's a little bit more of an intuitive workflow um, and to do that than to do um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's for me. It's the it, it's straightforward to use uh, uh, the tidyverse and so the tidy model. So that that syntax it's it's more clear to me than base R. It's uh, I need to think about that basically. While the other ones, yeah, like flowing. Um, it's it's better. But for example. Yeah. The, the, just the predict function is a generic function, so it's used at different uh, purposes and different packages and everything. So now I'm using to set up a data frame that I'm going to train. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, because if they let me go back to my um, my notes. Um, where here we go. Um, if you look at the the way that they're processing um, this, um, so you've got the original data frame, or like just the data not transformed here. Um, they're just it's just this um, gene expression, the um, GEXP data frame, and this is what we're calling the uh, fancy. Stop my share. Yes, I see. I saw uh, it. Yeah, it took a while, but then, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so the actual data frame here is um, the gene expression, the the GEXP, and every time we've gone through and all these different ways of doing this, um, they've just. Uh, performed, they've just created a new data frame every time. So as opposed to just sorry taking that data frame and typing it through. Yeah, sorry if I interrupt you again. That's but okay. I see a black screen saying, Alison uh, has started. Oh, now, now it's, it's okay, now it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I, um, I'm on, I'm using, so I don't have Wi-Fi at my, um, my dad's house where I am. So I'm using my cell phone data. So it may be a little, um, lagging, so I apologize. Um, but you can see here, like, so the, the transpose data, um, they're just making new data frames every time. So the NZV, they 
the, the non near zero variation one, they just use the transform data frame and with the, um, and then the um, removing the near zero variation, they're just, yeah, every time they're just doing new data frames with this for the, um, are you, although it looks like they Are you in the presentation and uh, I did no zero variant pre-processing things, huh? because uh, that's what I see. I yeah, see the yeah, that's where I am. Yeah. And then I'm scrolling down. Um, so it looks like here though, um, for the code, and I just took this directly from the book chapter. So it looks like here when they're trying to, um, oh, see, I see what they're doing. So instead of re um, creating a new data frame, they're just rewriting the transform data frame with the process and scale data. So they initially, Earlier, they just transformed it so that the gene expression was on the uh, levels were on the y axis instead of the x axis. And so instead of earlier with the near zero um, values removed, they created a new data frame for this. But and for this one, they just rewrote, uh, they just rescaled the data and saved that as the transformed gene expression. They didn't create a new data set or a new data frame for this one. Um, so it just depends. And it looks like they did that for um, for the other versions, but then for the um, NA ones, they did fill out, they made a new data frame with the um, the missing data frame, um, either imputing or removing the missing NAs from the data set. Um, could you link or um, you you've linked the tidy model before in the in the shared slides? Yeah. You you sent um, in the shared slides. I think in your chapter you um, did you put the the tidy models? Because um, it was last time we talked about the um, tidy models. We're doing the um, it was the ANOVA or something like that. Um, how they talked about doing this in a tidy method. I just would be curious to see like the tidy method of doing this, these steps. Is that in the tidy models book? Yeah, we can, we can even have a look at these things the next week if you like. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Um, and I, I mean, I, I don't know the, you know, if people who are going to watch us on YouTube or doing whatever, how many people are doing base R versus doing tidy. I, tell everyone I know I just like I only bother learning base R at this point I just do tidy um, so to see how to do these processes um, in a more tidy fashion I think would also be good um, and then next week I'll be back at work so I can like actually like get on my computer and show um, the um, like open up my R studio and actually like get in and show the workflow and like what comes from that I just can't do it on this computer all right um, so, um, after the pre-processing the data, um, so that at this point, before you go to split your data into a training set and a test set, you've got to, um, get your data clean. So we, we're, do, we've done that. And so now we're actually splitting the data into, um, the training data and the test data. And according to the book, they say that the gold standard is to take about 30% of your data as a test data. And then the other 70%, um, is the training data. Uh, is that what you have used for your work as well? About yeah, 70, yeah, 30? That's, yeah, that, that's now uh, the, the process that, that I know, because you then see okay. the data and then you apply, you feed the model, accept the model, fit the model. Yeah, so okay. basically this is a way to pre-process. And I just the, the only thing that was new to me is to use the predict function uh, before to apply the model. The, just this, I need to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah just, to, just another way to get the data ready for training. Um, so here, how they split this in base R, um, they're putting the sample IDs back into row names and then um, generating a random 70% for the, 
for the training data set. So that would be you know, creating a new data frame with the um, in train, um, labeling it as in train, um, and then um, separating the data into a training set and a test set. So just labeling it training testing. And then in tidy models, again, is there a way, is that part of just the, the workflow that you're just like, it separates out the, the two um, training and test sets? Okay. Uh, basically, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, exactly the same thing that you do uh, splitting the data on exactly the same. Okay. That's good. And then you apply um, again with the leak function, with the leak function. Mm -hmm. Oh, this one, um, oh, the, this, that was for, um, they're not doing the predict function on doing the training and the test. That was just to create the the split. Um, and so the next thing they rec they said to do is um, doing some unsupervised learning on the training data to kind of get the initial clusters generated. So here, um, they're using k nearest neighbors, um, just doing any way to you know however you know if you can do k nearest neighbors you can do, um, yeah you know whatever is a good way to cluster your data, whatever makes the most sense to do it, you know, probably realistically trying a couple different methods to do it. Um, so here they just did the K nearest neighbors um, with the training data set and then um, had the labels of the data set and then they're doing um, five clusters. And again, this is kind of dependent on the number, uh, I mean, just like of the data, like what you're kind of looking at. And with the training data set, we should know how many groups are in there and before. And so this is more just to see, does this unsupervised method fit your training data set, which again, you already know the labels of your training data set. So you're making sure that this is what fits correctly. Um, and then you can predict how that k nearest neighbor, however you fit it, um, would do on your test set before you go and do the supervised learning. So that's what they do here um, using the data on the, um, they're using the k-nearest neighbors to perform the uh, predictions on the test data. Um, in this case though, um, instead of actually using that 30% of that, that training data, that test data, um, here they're just seeing how well that model applies to the training data. Um, so just performing the Kaner's neighbors again, predicting how that would perform. So you saw how it was done previously, like this is what it actually came out as. And then they're just doing the same thing again with the predict method to see how well that model does again on the training set um, as a prediction as opposed to a known. All right, and then that's as far as I got. I was able to get the slides prepared beforehand. Um, but I think if we go to the um, actual slides. Um, has this switched for you to the actual book slides now? Yeah. So do you see 5.7? Okay. Yeah. Just before I started talking. Um, so to see. Um, with this unsupervised data, we need to see how well it actually worked before we can um, do the training, before we actually perform like the supervised machine learning. Um, and so we want to classify, um, you know, type one error and type two error. So we want to see how many of the false positives were actual positives. So that would be type one error and then type two error, um, how many of the negatives were classified as a false positive. Um, so we want to see the accuracy. So the sensitivity is, uh, this is something that I should know better and I always, always mess it up. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so they define it here. Um, so the precision of the model, the number of true positives divided by the total of true positives and false positives. So essentially the 
the top row divided by the sum of the top row, like the true positives divided by true and false positives altogether. Um, about how confident we are in the calls of um, how many were actually this particular phenotype. Um, if it's really precise, you're not going to have a lot of false positives. Um, if it's not so pre pre precise, you're going to have more false positives. Um, and on that note, then with the sensitivity, you've got your true positives, um, and then together your false positives and your true negatives. Um, so if you've got a really precise model, you should have a high level of true positives and true negatives. You really shouldn't have that many false positives. Um, so your precision, you want the precision to be as close to one as possible, you know, ideally as close to one as possible. If you've got more false positives, your precision is going to decrease. Um, well, yeah, if you've got more, yeah, it's going to decrease. Um, and then with sensitivity, um, this, if you, again, if you have um, not many false, uh, true, oh, excuse me, false negatives, or false positives, um, you then are going to um, also have something be as close to one as possible. All of these, you want them as close to one as possible. If it's less precise, less sensitive, less specific, you're going to have it. It's going to decrease. Um, so essentially this model, if it makes fewer mistakes, it's going to call less um, false positive. Um, if something is highly sensitive, it's going to mean that it's calling the phenotype as truly calling the phenotype, and it's not missing. It's able to readily separate, like, the phenotype is present, it's calling it versus the phenotype is not present, it's not calling it. And the example they just give here is looking at sick people versus healthy people. Um, if you go to the doctor and they're like, okay, you're sick, and they actually classify you as sick, or if you're healthy, they actually classify you as healthy, and you're not getting that many healthy people or sick people um, that are not being classified as healthy. Um, so that's the sensitivity. Um, and specificity of that is sort of the inverse. So in the in this context, if you're at the doctor and they're saying um, healthy people versus sick people, um, the sick people are, um, I mean, the healthy people are not being called as sick. Again, they're being, the positives, in this case, the healthy, um, are being called as healthy and they're not being called as sick. So that's the specificity. Um, the true negatives divided by the total of the true negatives and the false positives. Um, so what do they say about balanced accuracy? Um, I've never used, I've never heard of this particular statistic before, the balanced accuracy, um, classifying all examples, um, essentially looking at this precision and the sensitivity divided by two. So I guess it's just averaging um, these together as opposed to just having just one or just the other being used as a um, metric. Um, and then let's see. In the example, they give the, um, the canary's neighbor training data um, and they perform the imbalances. Yeah, the balancing. Yeah. Um, so the balance here, uh, the canary's neighbor training data predicted the labels. Um, the calculate the accuracy of matrix using the confusion matrix function or the training accuracy. Um, and so your one minus accuracy is your training error. So essentially how well your data are um, being classified. So with this, again, we did this in the previous slide where you're looking at your k-nearest neighbors um, and then performing the predictions. And then, so generating the confusion matrix here um, based off the classification. Um, so really high sensitivity. So you've got very few um, false positives here. Um, and then a couple false negatives just to, um, so this being explained, um, 
the accuracy, so the number of um, all right, see, I thought here this would this accuracy then would have been um, one hundred percent because you've got no false negatives. Is that false negatives or false positives? You've got no false positives here. Um, and so if you're looking at that, oh, the accuracy is the um, okay, I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're doing the accuracy of the precision plus the sensitivity divided by two. I was gonna say, because the um, the precision is, in this case, would be 100%. Um, and then, um, so that's the accuracy of that. And then sensitivity and specificity, 97% um, sensitivity because you've only got the two, um, that were called as the false negatives, the two um, there, and then um, everything else is classified correctly. Um, so overall, I'd say that this model, the K nearest neighbors with the five um, clusters for this would be an appropriate fit. Um, and then, so now they're looking at the, so this is just on the training data, how well this performed. And so looking at this again on um, the test data, um, so again, using the, um, the same model fit, um, predicting how it would go, and then performing the confusion matrix um, statistics. Um, and you get pretty similar results, um, just with smaller values. Again, it's still misclassified too, but it, it is less sensitive because you've got um, fewer values um, overall, so instead of having the two and 63, it's two and 25, so it looks less, um, or it is less, I should say. Um, again, the specificity is still 100%. Um, so looking at this, I would say that this is um, still the model fits fairly well, um, that the test set accuracy is not as good as the training accuracy, um, and that's pretty normal because you don't want your model overfitted because um, it may not actually be predictive of real world data. Um, and then another way to look at this too, um, receiver operator characteristics. Um, the easiest way that I can explain it is that you've got your, I think I've got a graph of it there. Yeah, your, your sensitivity and then your one minus specificity. Um, and then, oh, that's always how I've seen that. Um, Frederick, do you have a better explanation of the ROC curve? It, my brain's kind of blanking right now. Um, but essentially, you're looking to see. Um, I know with these curves, though, you're looking for this smooth um, line. I've had I've created ROC curves before um, when I don't have enough data to accurately make it, um, where this is a very um, it doesn't form this kind of smooth line. It just kind of is stepwise. And so I knew I didn't have enough data there to be able, I didn't have enough data points to really accurately create this curve and be able to get usable information from this. Um, Maybe with, with resampling, then you have more models and then you can compare um, you have a list of values for the specificity, a list of values for, of the, um, for the sensitivity, and then you can build up a nice rock curve because you've got more points. And uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Basically, the ROC yeah. curve. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I'm saying... I'm listening. Oh, um, but the, yeah, the, the ROC curve is used to, um, you kind of, you, the optimal point for your data is going to be at the inflection point um, of sensitivity and the one minus specificity. Um, so here are the inflection point. Um, it's a pretty start, you know, if, in, if there's enough data points here, again, this data set's pretty small, so it's probably why it's a little bit more of an um, angular curve graph as opposed to a smooth graph for it. Um, but the inflection point here um, would indicate where the model is best 
fitted. Is that correct? Basically, the uh, area under the curve, it's uh, the area under the, the rock uh, curve. This, this one, this area under the, mm -hmm. the curve is the... Yeah. Uh, if, if you are clo closer you are to the 100 percent, better is the performance of the model. So mm -hmm. quite nice. So if not overfitting the data, uh, it's, it's, it's a very good job, a good, good model. Uh, gotcha. Uh, yeah. So basically, okay. yeah, it's the area under the curve. It's calculated okay. the area underneath this mm -hmm. uh, rock curve, and it says I don't know. It's like ninety-eight percent. If it reaches oh, okay, yeah. hundred percent, is overfitted, but it's perfect. Or otherwise, it's mm -hmm. so a bit less. If you have like sixty-eight percent of A under the curve, you you might want to search something else to 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 find a better model. The okay. Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. So that like, if it were less fitted, let me see if I can annotate on here. Um, if it were less fitted, you could say that the curve would maybe look something more like that. And so you've got less area under the curve, so your model isn't as strong. Yeah, okay, that makes, that makes sense. Yeah, it's just another way of looking at, um, more of a visual representation of your specificity and sensitivity. Cool. All right, turn off the invitation. Um, all right, so, oh yeah, and the area under the curve, you can, um, the function to return that. I've never, is there a tidy way of doing the ROC curves? Uh, you know? You you do, you uh, basically uh, you can use the uh, that there's uh, other ways you can basically uh, build up the the the, the rock curve with ggplot using different okay. values of specificity and sensitivities and then mm -hmm. you set up like one minus specificity on the x-axis and the sensitivity on the y-axis so it plots the um the rock curve and then uh, you can like uh extrapolate uh you can th there is the roc uh, function or something like that and then you can uh retrieve the the area under the curve yeah okay okay so there's but there's no like package like this specifically to just plot create the ROC. It just takes a little bit of um of the just getting your um data points labeled correctly and then just plotting it in ggplot. Yeah, yeah, you can use this this function to uh, in a tidy uh, uh, in a tidy syntax to retrieve the values and then plot it on ggplot. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, so not not really too difficult. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we'll go ahead and I think this is probably a good um halfway point for the chapter. Um, I actually want to say, yeah, it actually is pretty much 5.8 is the, the halfway. Um, so yeah, we'll, maybe we can pick this up next time, but um, going into the, um, as we did in the unsupervised chapter, um, looking at how we pick the best K for the K nearest neighbors, um, and they are going through and again like i would we can pick this up next week but essentially just trying to figure out like the making these kind of elbow plots and uh well this isn't an elbow plot but looking to see um what amount of groups is going to give you the least amount of error um and based off this graph um you can you know the lowest amount of training error is between three and six um uh, 
K nearest neighbors, uh, the value of three to six to K just based off these plots alone. And then if you really look at like where the dip lowest is, is five. So we, this was um, truly the best point. But if you wanted to see in a real world data set um, to be able to determine um, what your best um, K value is, there is a way to kind of see how it um, it fits. And you're just in this, you are creating a function that or you're doing a loop that for every k value through the k values of 1 through 12 um you're performing the k nearest neighbors and then um the same thing as before predicting it on the training set again and then creating the confusion mirror, um, matrix um for it and then we're just plotting um the training error um of all of the different um points so that's uh actually a lot more straightforward than i thought it would be yeah just really creating a pretty basic for loop yeah um how did they yeah well yeah we'll, we'll go into the um we'll pick this up later next time i don't want to get too much into like the discrepancies between the training and the test right now um, cause this is a pretty important point, I think. Uh, yeah, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, Fred, you got any questions or comments? Um, no, I'm okay. Uh, so I think we, we, um, can, uh, like have a look at the, uh, like few minutes next week about tidy models and see, uh, how it performs on the same, on the same data. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful. Um, would you mind preparing some of that for next week? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and even just a few minutes of that, and I'll try to get, um, you know, I think this chapter is a pretty big chapter. It may take a couple of weeks to go over it. Um, but I do think seeing it in tidy models would be really helpful. And then um, we can go more into the model tuning and then um, some like just keep working our way through chapter five um because this i think starting at 5.12 is when they actually go into um the supervised machine learning processes um yeah so we'll just we'll just keep chipping away at it okay thank you thank you all right i'll see you next week bye bye bye, bye.